Winner of the 1990 Audience Award for Dramatic Feature at the Sundance Film Festival and released theatrically that same year, Longtime Companion is a fictional story of a small group of friends and the changes in their world, beginning from the fateful day in 1981 when the New York Times article that noted the outbreak of a rare cancer in the gay community was published. It was the first wide release theatrical film to deal with the subject of AIDS. Hello everybody, my name is Jim Farmer. I'm an arts reporter based out of Atlanta. I'm also the outreach coordinator for Gallica, the Society of LGBTQ Entertainment Critics. I'm so very happy to be uh, moderating this panel along with Juan. So thank you so much. I'll start Jim, with Would you that. like to introduce everyone? Yeah, yeah. Um, this on World AIDS Day, we wanted to look back at the significance of this film. And I'll just say that this is a film that has meant so much to so many people, to me professionally and personally. So thank you all for your involvement. Um, I'm very happy to introduce members of the Longtime Companion team, writer Craig Lucas, Stephen Caffrey, who played Fuzzy, Dermot Moroney, who played John, and Bruce Davison, who played David. For his performance in the film, Bruce Davison won a Golden Globe Award for Best Supporting Actor and was nominated for an Academy Award as well. I am so honored to be speaking to all of you. Thank you so much. I'm going to start with the first question, then we're going to, then we're going to rotate and then take some questions from our viewers. Um, Craig, I, I wanted to ask you, first of all, what made you want to write this? And for the performers, how did you get involved as well? Uh... Director Norman Rene and I made a short film for PBS. And after we did that, the producer, Lindsay Law, asked us if we wanted to make another movie, a feature. And I had been slowly meeting with people in the studio system, and they would invariably say, so do, do, is there something you want to make? And I would say, well, yeah, I mean, you know, there's this, <laughs> this epidemic um, annihilating the community of <clears throat> gay men that I'm in the middle of and other people too. And, uh, you know, I'd really like to, to, to dr dramatize some of what I'm witnessing. And they would say, yeah, but after that, is there another picture you want to make? Oh. Um, so we went to Lindsay with this idea and he said, I'm in, let's do it. Mm. And Norman had very clear ideas about the small quotidian ways in which lives change day by day. Um, maybe from having studied Chekhov, but he was also interested in the less melodramatic things in life and, and the ways that things change when someone passes you a cup of coffee. And we talked a lot about the world that we were coming of age in, you know, the community of largely uh, sort of banal people that we knew. <laughs> <laughs> there had been lots of films in which gay people were characterized as exotic and incredibly witty and extreme and dramatic. And, 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 and Norman would say to me, is it just me or like, aren't like the people that we meet, the gay people we meet at the gym and at the grocery store, aren't they sort of boring? Aren't they sort of like everybody else and just trying to get by? And would it be worth looking at a subset of those people and seeing how unprepared they are for this cataclysm and and, and maybe examining their privileges and how those are stripped away when they get thrown into the healthcare system and they realize how vulnerable they are? And... Um, so that was the animating idea behind it. And I wrote a whole script that I threw out that didn't work. And it wasn't my idea, it was Norman's to go one day a year through the first nine years of the, of the epidemic. I guess now we would say it was a pandemic. Hmm. 
I auditioned. Craig, were you there? Were you in the room? It was in Beverly Hills. I wasn't. I didn't. I didn't. I, I, I had a friend who was sick, so I wasn't around a lot. I don't know if you remember that, but I was often not there. No, I, I remember you so well. It's amazing to hear you talk. Um, who cast? Who was in that room? I know Norman was there. I think it was Jason Lapadura, wasn't it? Yeah. Sound right? So grateful for that day. Um, and I auditioned in New York, and um, my ex-wife had done a play with Norman and Greg and introduced us earlier on. And um, um, I was doing a play at the time. So uh, I got to uh, be in the room with everybody there. And it was, uh, at the time, it was a film that maybe PBS was going to show. Maybe they weren't, um, you know, uh, well, let's see what happens kind of film, you know. And so it was an independent film. And it was, uh, I, I, um, I read the script and the part that I read was just devastating. I had... I had the, the really the, the a key written scene, one key written scene in it that was breathtaking, and I uh, showed it to my um, Holland Taylor, who I was doing the play with, and I remember she came on stage, and and the teardrops were all down the front of her her gown from reading it backstage. She said, "Don't do that to me again." So uh, that was that was in New York. You guys were there then, and um, it, it was it was the luckiest break I ever got, and it didn't feel like it at the time. It just felt like something that I read that was the most honest, searing piece of writing I'd ever had an opportunity to be come part of, and uh, so that's what happened. I lucked out. Stephen. Uh, my recollection was I I, uh, I auditioned for it in New York. Um, I remember, like Bruce, uh, reading it and just, uh, well, you know, I'd done plays uh, about AIDS, but I hadn't, um, I hadn't seen a film or anything of any sort on uh, film or television. And I think it was a PBS thing at the time. And um, I read... Uh, I don't even recall the event, but I, I had a, a woman at the agency, Deborah Kletter, who was, I think, a good friend of the people in the uh, production company, Norman and, and Craig. And, and um, she was a, a booster on my behalf for this. And uh, this may sound crazy, Craig, but I seem to remember someone saying that you had seen me on a subway with a beard. And, and that somehow that intersected at the right moment. I, it sounds apocryphal at this point, but that's a recollection that I have. And, uh, and then, you know, call back and so forth. And, and uh, I was so uh, blessed to be brought on board. There you go. Hmm. Thank you. 26 minutes into the film, we see the fear of typecasting arise. Then later during the 1984 sequence, Stephen, your character goes off on a producer after he claims that a production can't get insurance for an actor, Patrick Cassidy's character. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but that actually tanked Jerry Herman's career after Cindy Adams disclosed his status in her page six column without his permission. Now, my question here is, were any of you aware of the real and present danger during that time of being associated with HIV and AIDS? By the way, I'm Juan Michael Porter II. I'm the senior editor of thebody.com, which is the world's largest publication to report on HIV and AIDS. So, uh, our director had HIV. And we knew that we wouldn't be able to make this movie if his status was reported on his insurance physical. Mm. And my partner at the time was a doctor who conducted his physical and fabricated 
both Norman and my partner Tim died ultimately of HIV. So everyone was very nervous and scared. I, my dentist was driven out of the business when it became known that he was HIV positive. And uh, an ex-lover of mine, Peter Evans, was cast in a small role in the movie because I had written a, a bigger role for him and they wouldn't, because it was known that he had HIV, they wouldn't let him be in the movie in, in a substantial way. And he, and he ultimately got sick while we were filming. And Robert Joy was kind enough to step in at the last minute and play that part. I wanted to, I, I rewatched this film yesterday and something that's always amazed me it, 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 is, is this is such a, a strong ensemble, such a tight ensemble. Obviously, beside the great work from you all, you have Campbell Scott, uh, Mary Louise Parker, Patrick Cassidy, Brian Cousins, Mark Lamos, Michael Shepling, uh, John Dossett. I, I guess my question for you is, did you all have a lot of time to get to know each other and rehearse beforehand to sort of you know, develop those relationships. We'll start with uh, we'll start with a uh, Bruce. Um, well, I, we had a lot of time in the scenes in which we were an ensemble. Mm -hmm. There were certain uh, party scenes in which all of us were together uh, at the beach in uh, Fire Island, and um, everybody was just getting started. Then there'd be three of us or four of us together. But um, we all, or else we would connect with characters that came in and I got to know everybody and really be friends, you know, over the years. We got to remember what, what it was like then. Back in 1989, it was a totally different world. I mean, uh, it was, um, I was, I was told by my managers and stuff, don't touch this. We don't want to go near this. Now, this is not good for your career. And that happened to so many people, all of us, all across uh, the spectrum there. And um, it just was something, first of all, my, my manager, my, my agent and my commercial agent all died just six months before the film was finally released. Uh, it was a, a time of great catastrophe. I, while we were working uh, on the beach scene down there with Craig, uh, I remember the um, I remember that day. I remember when Peter Evans died just before he was supposed to shoot the part that Robert Joy did. We were shooting down there. The script girl was at my feet, six feet away, crying for the loss of her brother who was dying and. And the makeup man was outside looking at a house across the way. And I said, what, what, what's, what's wrong? And he said, uh, it's a house share for seven of us. And I'm the only one left. I got about six months. Mm -hmm. So it was ever present. It was uh, surrounding us all at the time. And uh, it really felt like uh, this little film was against the world at the time we were this we were living in a little place where we're saying you gotta see this you gotta see this and um the courage of uh craig and norman in putting this into such painful real terms that you couldn't look away from you had to be there like you said, it was the, so many of the scenes were everyday scenes, but they were so real and so clear to every living human being that watched this film that I've ever encountered. And I have had more, uh, not necessarily compliments, but people that I've identi I have identified come up to me and say, you know, you really, I lived that. I lived that. I lived that moment. And, you know, on, on all sides, because eventually it's a moment we all live. You know, we've all got to go through that door and it's just how it's handled and how it's done. And um, the writing in it was just so superb. I mean, there was even the, the, the punctuation and the little bits my daughter says now, we don't have punctuation anymore, only em emojis. 
And I said, but, yeah, but in that one scene we did, every beat was written. Yeah. It was clear and was sharp as a razor. So uh, as an actor, when you're looking at that, you just have to be part of something like that, wherever it takes you. Yeah. Stephen? Did you say Stephen or David? Yes. Yeah, oh, we're talking uh, about ensemble and working together and getting to. Oh know yes, yeah, well, well, we 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 were fortunate to have a couple of weeks rehearsal, which never happens with camera uh, work, and of course we were doubly fortunate to have a, a man who was a playwright write the script. And as Bruce said, you know, uh, the you know right down to the ellipses or the you know the the punctuation, the, it was just to be done thus you know like a pinter or something you just uh um you were in the service of it and and uh, of course that plague was as bruce says was just pervasive i lived in the west village and um from the early 80s and uh i can't even think of how many friends in the theater uh it was just it was everywhere it was a you know a horrible uh time and you and yet you're young and you're trying to be vital so you're you're fighting against this um um it was just a uh, extraordinary thing to see it on paper and then be able to play it out and the rehearsal helped bond us tremendously i think i played racquetball with campbell and had lunch uh, you know stuff like that to create some sort of energy between us uh, okay. uh outside of the rehearsal so there you go okay and dermot well, and certainly, Stephen, being able to spin in and start singing Dream Girls that <laughs> would take a little rehearsal. Tell me, please, that that didn't just happen. Uh, it wasn't in the script originally. It wasn't maybe in the Maybe that's script. Norman, right, who added so much to such a beautiful script. And maybe the overhead shot of John Deacon and gasping was Norman, too. I wasn't aware he was HIV positive when we worked together. And in some strange ways, my existence in that age, I was already in California. I wasn't in New York City. Um, wasn't as touched by it by as, as yours guys describing. Um, but since then, this film, I can't speak any further, but I'm, uh, it's such a part of me. Yeah. So blessed to be here. Thank you. Um, you know, Dharmit, I actually had a question for you. I, I, <laughs> I, uh, you are essentially the twink of the film, <laughs> the young hope. Yeah, now they have a word for it. Back they do. Then, it wasn't called twink. <laughs> they didn't have that. So that <laughs> imposing modern uh, <laughs> lexicon on something that certainly you're about to say some 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 character like that had never been filmed. Has it even been seen since? Where there was such a joyful gay young man. <laughs> so blessed to get that part. For me, I was looking at you. I thought, oh, that's who I would be if I was in this film at that time. And you represent the promise that was lost. And I'm curious for you being the first to go and then being the one who's so... and impactful when you come back to represent that fit fantasy sequence of what if this disease didn't happen? What if it hadn't existed? Could you walk us through for that, um, for what that was like for you being yes. a the spirit of hope that's cut short and then the revival of what it could be? I, I do remember once we were in New York and thank God we had those rehearsals. I'm working for the first time, maybe the last time since a true theater director. Um, and I went to a bookshop looking for books on um, male modeling. <sighs> and yeah, I found one that said how to be a male model. Uh, so that, and maybe you guys remember my deck shoes. And I was good to go. Um, that time Bruce discussed, touched on in Fire Island was exactly that. A group of men all together, like partying and cooking for each other, sharing houses. I had... Um, Brian and um and and Michael with me in hours. Um Michael Schofling, I can still picture warming himself in front of the oven 
<laughs> <laughs> with the door open because they hadn't turned on the seasonal heat steam heat or whatever yet um and getting for the first time ever full body makeup in the morning with cold water on a brown sponge so <laughs> having done that many times since uh it was an unforgettable moment trying to pack a radio mic 1989 size into a speedo you tell me how they're gonna do that um, so yeah i got a lot of memories of the movie but best of all is working those scenes on the on the deck in that house mary louise and 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 uh, campbell and you guys incredible to show that group of people sort of before the storm right so there aren't any other movies really that i can remember that go directly to the present how do I put it? You said it takes place over nine years. In fact, yes, it's structured. So you visit them once a year. Um, but I think that's quite brilliant, too, that when we were watching that movie, it was right now. Mm -hmm. The result of our narrative landed us in that movie theater seat in the present. And that was so powerful. Maybe others have mentioned it, but that final scene, I'd actually left. And they flew me back the next day. You guys will recall, we reshot that for reasons somewhat still unknown to me, but you know, they told the insurance company there was a hair in the gate. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there was a really fast, the most famous hair I've ever had <laughs> in a gate. <laughs> um, but whatever your thinking was on that, you guys, you nailed it. And that's an unforgettable cinematic moment now. It's gone beyond our meaning one single viewer, us as a group that were involved in this film, the film going world, it's beyond that. I mean, try and tell me a better, more hopeful return, more redemptive ending to a movie about loss and death. It's incredible. Thank you, Craig. I have a, a question for Craig. Um, and, and you all have referenced this earlier. Um, Norman Rene, who directed the film, discovered he was HIV positive between pre-production and the start of filming. Um, he later died of complications from AIDS in 1996. Craig, how would you say that um, his own diagnosis affected the filming? Um, thank you. Um, is it Juan Michael or Juan? Yes. Juan Michael. Um, Norman was one of the most unusual people I've ever known. He... Um, his father committed suicide around the time that we were first working together. And Norman said to me and to all of his close friends, Debbie Kletter and others, I'm not going to follow my father's path. I'm not going to live joyously or in bitterness or resentment. I'm not interested in that journey. So, As I mentioned, my spouse was his doctor, and when 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 Norman was diagnosed, I didn't know because doctors aren't supposed to divulge that kind of information. But Norman pulled me aside and told me, and um, and he said, "I'm I'm not going to live like a person who's leaving the world because we don't. The future is not written, and we don't know anything, and I'm going to live." proactively and joyously and I'm going to have a good time it was really something to see because I maybe because I'm a dramatist and my job is to see how bad things can go in a story I'm always looking for the complication that's going to ruin everybody's joy but Norman didn't live that way and he felt that characters in plays and movies were always trying to make their lives better and he felt that audiences went to plays and movies to learn how to live their lives better that that's what we're watching for mm. uh so that was like i've never encountered anyone who thought that way or or lived that way and it's and it's the one thing that has held me in good stead as an artist and as a person to try to set aside the storytelling part because if I indulge in that, then you know I'm oh we're going to go on a road trip and then we're all going to be killed in a 19 car collision. You know that's that's the way my mind works, and Norman didn't want to do that and didn't want to live that way. So we laughed a lot while we were making this movie mm -hmm. 
because the, also the thing is that characters are innocent of the future. Yeah. You don't get up in the morning and go, well, today I'm going to suddenly learn about a new disease that might take my life and all my friends. So finding the ways that people live joyfully and fully and, and, and proceed in the face of desolation was, was really Norman's way of living too. Uh, we we made another movie and, and got paid more money than we'd ever been paid before. And Norman went and lived in Rome for a year or two. It was like, I, I, I don't care that I'm sick. I'm going to go have fun. I'm going to live in Rome and learn Italian and eat a lot of Italian food. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about the sort of shame that was built into being queer, gay, and living with HIV. And yet yeah, you... The film, when I watch it, I see this defense of being young, of having sex, of, of that right. And I, I'm curious what that was like for you, because I also see the segment with, um, oh, he was the model, the guy who was talking about, oh, people who have sex like that recklessly aren't thinking about their bodies. And how that read to me was actually a, a rebuke to that idea that people were living they weren't thinking about, I'm going to die. They were doing what anyone else was doing. And for me, living with HIV, I, I see that moment and I'm like, aha, right. I didn't walk out into a room thinking I'm going to go acquire a disease. And I'm curious for you, if you were at the same mindset when writing this moment. It was a complicated time because gay liberation was very costly. And not many of us came from backgrounds where our parents and friends and communities said, oh, how wonderful, you're queer. That's a great. I, I mean, <laughs> um, so there was all this shame. You know, when when Longtime Companion was released, I, I, I went on the Today Show and my mother called me and said, please, please don't tell Deborah Norville and Brian Gumble that you're gay. I'll lose all my friends. Yeah. you know and I said well mom maybe that's not true I, they're your friends they love you and maybe they won't abandon you or or turn against you um but that fear was so pervasive of being sort of shoved out of the circle of love um and there was a lot of pushback against the idea that this was a virus within the community of nobody's going to take away my sense of pleasure now. This is a this is some kind of a conspiracy. You know, this is the CIA trying to get us to stop having sex or something. So it's it's easy to forget how messy and painful and confusing it was from moment to moment. Mm. Uh, would our participants like to I, I would suggest raising your hand, maybe or. The emoji thing to signal that you would like to ask a question? Yes, Ariana, please. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say um, I'm a little emotional, but um, my uncle passed away from age related illness in uh, the 90s. So I never got to meet him. And I only just saw this film uh, for the first time last night. And I think something that brings me the most pain about my uncle is not knowing if he was lonely or if he experienced that self-hatred if he was without that queer love and community that this film does such a great job of showing and balancing with levity and, and joy um and i just finished an undergrad thesis in his honor looking at less than zero and the doom generation and how what it chooses to say or not say about aids how that's what that sends in regards to queer messages and so my question is what do you think is the value of looking back at films released during the AIDS crisis and talking about how they went acknowledging or not acknowledging the crisis? And what does it say about the industry that so many of these AIDS or AIDS adjacent movies are difficult or uncommon to screen? Um, it was very interesting because the next year was Philadelphia where Tom Hanks won the Academy Award playing a gay man dying of AIDS. Um, I, I I was doing a TV series at the same time that uh, the nominations and all the rubber chicken stuff happened. 
And um, my co-star was dying in the hospital in Century City. And I would visit him and I say, I feel like such a such a farce. I have such guilt about going, receiving all these, you know, plaudits and rewards and thank yous for a film. Uh, being a heterosexual man, it, it just feels terrible. And he grabbed me by the shirt and he said, this is your chance to tell my story. Do it. Do it as, to the best of your power. And um, I told that story to uh, uh, Tom Hanks. We, we all were doing the, you know, the Golden Globes and stuff. And I told him that. And I think he got to carry that on. But each each time something changes a little bit, the world moves in increments, but we do evolve. I really think we do evolve and it takes time for some, some never do, but you know, as you move along through life, you see how things do evolve as, as did uh, certainly not a cure. There's still not a cure, but there's, there's a way to live that we all suddenly um, find a way to get to. And I think that the movies and stuff that are done are, are, have so much more importance than people give it credit for. It's a shame that this is an independent film and wasn't, you know, a $100 million blockbuster that everybody got to see and learn from. But uh, it paved the way. It opened the door. Thank you for that. Uh, Nathaniel Rogers, I see your hand up. Um, yes, I just I, I wanted to talk about uh, the independent nature um, that Bruce just mentioned. And when you were making it, you obviously had a very meaningful experience making it. But you never know with with smaller films, for lack of a better word, how mm -hmm. what the reception is going to be like, especially something like this coming at a time when people were so uh, much more scared than they are now about talking about these issues. So when did you all begin to feel that the movie was obviously, you know, became a, a big deal and Bruce was nominated and now, but when did you all start feeling like, oh, people are really receiving this in the spirit that we were hoping they would? Like, did you, did you notice, was there any moment? <laughs> yeah, uh, go, go Bruce, I'm sorry. No, I, I just, I know the exact moment it happened for me. The film was playing at Sundance. And there were you know, 10, 20 people in this one screening. And suddenly I heard this woman sobbing, <sighs> you know, like that. And I, it, not until that moment did I realize the impact and the power this had on everybody, you know, going through a door and getting your loved one to let go. It, suddenly there it was. And, uh, that's when um, the Sam Goldwyn company grabbed it too, and and, and it finally had a distribution. But uh, I remember the moment was that woman's cry in the audience, in a seat full of seven or ten people in the audience. I can remember the the fact that it was going to get a theatrical release was mind blowing. We didn't expect that at all, or at least not when we finished principal photography. Yeah, um, and. <laughs> it, it it was also one of those things you thought well nobody's nobody's really gonna this is gonna be a small film even though we you might have recognized that it was important the audience for it was hardly a mass market audience but uh, I can even remember I was in Paris the following spring and there it was on the side of a, a billboard and within just a month or two and I can say that this still happens today. Uh, people would run up and, and hug you who had had, who'd either had the experience of lo losing their lover, their brother, their, you know, whoever. Um, and without the beard, I'm not as identifiable with the film, but, you know, I'll be in a theater and another actor will read the bio on, uh, you know, backstage. And then the next thing you know, uh, hugs, tears, and all kinds of other um, uh, what, what, what wonderful things come. So it was uh, something that started, it was a little engine that turned into something quite large in my life anyway. 
That's what I would say too. Thank you, Stephen. Same for me. It's only grown in ways that is incredible. So it never left. Um, and so we're at it this long, and you and, and so there's no way to anticipate. Even even when we knew it was powerful, Bruce's performance, that nomination, it was just staggering, incredible accomplishment. Um, but you had 30 years on that. And you can't even calculate how strong, how many lives, how many people have shared their lives with me over this role, even within this beautiful movie. So gosh, to be that young man that's lost, it's meant so much to so many people. Can't even speak to it. Yeah. I I I I remember one of the the moment that stuck with me in the film is an odd little tiny moment. And it was uh, the bunch of us in the backyard. And, so, and Spruce, I think, saw someone walk by and said, did you see that? What's that? What are those red marks? That's KS. It's impossible to, to communicate unless you were alive at that time, and certainly in a major city. The number of people you would see where you, their collar was too big for their neck and or they would have marks. And it, it was it wasn't just... It wasn't just the the loss or people disappearing. It was that you were seeing the manifestation of this fucking, oh, sorry, of the damn thing in front of you on the streets every day, you know, or backstage or, you know, uh, you know, someone. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, now I'm I'm catching your emotion, Dermot. <laughs> Right. Stephen is referencing Kaposi sarcoma, which is an indication of late stage untreated HIV on its way to or actually having AIDS. And uh, just noting on that, as of 1996, there was uh, effective HIV treatment and currently treatment exists such that people are able to become virally suppressed. Um, essentially, it's like for me, I you would think that I'm not living with HIV. The blood doesn't detect it. And so We've come a long way, and I think that this film kind of points to, to the direction of where we could go. We have time for one last question. I'm going to give it over to you, Ariana. It looked like your hand was up. Yes, please. Is that okay? I don't know if somebody else who hasn't asked yet has one. You're here. Um, okay, thanks. Um, so the movie is very much about romance and the loss of romantic partners, and so it's very telling that John's death which happens first and as uh, Juan Michael so brilliantly talks about, um, happens without a lover. And others talk about John as if he's like this loveless, careless early stage loss. But honestly, Willie is this the most re intimate relationship he has and their embrace is so special. And I keep thinking about that scene at Fire Island um, when he's walking with Willie and he sees the deer. And it's so beautiful. And, and so my question is uh, for Craig or, or Dermot or whomever, um, did you always know that this first friendship would be the beginning point of the film? And why do you think it's significant that John sees this deer and shares this moment with Willie, not by himself? Well, I can quickly answer, uh, but I want to know Craig's, you know, mindscape on that. It's so interesting that you hit on that part because that's the part that I could really relate to. For me, it would be being a straight man, but best friends are so close intimately close with a gay man so that friendship that wasn't a romance i think spoke volumes and beyond the, beyond romantic um um relationships so it, i'm so glad you reminded me of that sensation because that's how i felt with campbell when i was working with him like really a loving intimacy but it was never written as they had a thing or that. So it also touches on, um, I think Juan Michael, you asked about early hope and how that character represents that. But not, I think the fact that he wasn't in a relationship, just you know that he would have been or there's, or, or it, it, it opened the doors to that being even a greater loss or it amplified that, the single guy that didn't get a chance. So um, thanks for letting me speak on that and reminding me how important that friendship story is um because that's what was important to me at that age i'm so young but i felt kind of like a badge of courage on that that i had gay friends i know that sounds the way it sounds but that's how young i was and we're just coming out of the throes of a different mindset that was so naturally and so so casually homophobic so 
I felt like I, since I had gay friends in 1986, that I was kind of cool. It's, it's <laughs> really, it, it, honestly, it's a weird thing to say, but I think in this context, you know precisely what I mean. So I honored that in that performance and I felt a kinship um, that I knew other people my age who maybe were straight no, I didn't have. So anyway, that's a tiny little nuance, but yeah, to share. Craig, did you have something to say? By the way, uh, Dermot, Dur you are cool, forever cool. <laughs> no, I know, but that's one of the things that helped. <laughs> so thanks to you guys this whole time. Who knew if I just, just pitched in earlier uh, that I'd have such incredible uh, following in this community. Stephen and Bruce, you know what I mean. It's a there's there's the gay film community and then there's us so it's really something it really is uh, kind of a badge of courage that i share with such honor with you and with campbell and with the rest of that cast of course Craig, would you like to finish us off um norman was my best friend and he was incredibly funny and original not like anyone else and there's something profoundly romantic about a best friend when you're finding your way in the world for the first time. I, I was a really late bloomer. I didn't understand anything. And Norma kind of walked me through, um, like, how to be in the world, you know? I miss him every day. And I carry him with me and Willie and John are a duo in the world so and that deer I, I moved up to the country in right before we made this movie and I was driving up here with Norman and I said that's so funny I never see any deer. And he was like, well, I think you should slow down because they're all along the road right now. And it, I hadn't seen them. There they were in the woods along the Taconic Parkway, like hundreds of them. I just hadn't seen them. It's other people, you know, like they say, God speaks to us through other people and, or nature or whatever you want. And Norman was that person for me who just opened wonder to the world because I was so afraid. I've always been so, so, so afraid. Thank you, Craig. Um, thank you, everyone. And the Black Church, we often say, look what God has done. But I say to you, the cast, look what y'all have done. Uh, everyone, thank you for being a part of this wonderful conversation. Viewers, you can follow us on Gallica. You should. Uh, you should follow Gallica on Twitter, X, Instagram, Facebook, and the Dorian Wards. Um, this is a really emotional experience, I can tell for all of us. And I, I just want to close with, on friendship, when we see Dermot's character come back, I actually coughed, cried. I was like, <laughs> and started like compulsively crying. And so... Craig, thank you for bringing that moment into the film for us to hold on to. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful um, evening, and it's World AIDS Day on Friday. Make sure you do something for someone living with HIV if you can. <laughs> <laughs>